along with Harvard and Georgetown with the mission to foster American understanding of contemporary developments in Europe. In 1999, the university merged this University of California Center for German and European Studies with the Center for Western European Studies and as such established the Institute of European Studies. Later in 2009, the Institute of European Studies and the UC Berkeley Institute of Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies established together a European Union Center that meanwhile has become a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. As such, we have become one of the leading centers for research and education in Europe in the Western United States through interdisciplinary uh, public events uh, research programs, grant opportunities, and community outreach. We seek to enrich America's understanding of Europe at Berkeley and throughout the state of California. Today's event is a very nice example of this, and I'm therefore also very grateful uh, to Anna for organizing this and look forward to um, the discussions. Um, because of my busy schedule, I will not be able to uh, attend all the presentations, but I will uh, try to attend as many uh, as possible. I hope uh, you will all enjoy the presentations. I hope that the discussions will prove relevant uh, and interesting. And without further ado, I now give the floor to Anna, who will tell you more about the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeron. And thank you very much for hosting the event today. Um, my name is Anna Terradvet. I work at the Institute of International Studies in Berkeley. And with uh, David Powers, we are also the ASFPM International Committee co-chairs. Um, so the webinar we are going to see today is part of a, an annual exchange uh, between the EU and the US that started last year when Ioannis invited us to give a presentation to talk about flood risk management in the US uh, for the EU uh, working group on floods. So we would like to keep this uh, connection and, and have an annual um, webinar on exchanging knowledge. So today we are gonna talk about innovations in, in Europe that has happened in the recent years. Um, Ioannis is going to start talking about the EU floods directive and lessons learned after the second cycle of implementation. Then we will have Kimo Lager from Deltares, who is going to talk about the flood risk mapping portal in the Netherlands. We'll continue with Mark Adamson, who is going to talk about um, natural hazard overview and, and risk assessment. He's going to talk about the national risk assessment and mapping program that has been developed at the watershed scale in the in Ireland. And we will finish with um, Clement Snowhall, who is from the Federal Ministry of Agriculture, Regions and Tourism in Austria. And he's going to talk about um, an interesting, innovative uh, public private partnership, insurance partnership tool that they are trying to do some calculations of flood damages using multi criteria analysis. So um, during the presentation, you can type your questions in the chat and David is gonna collect them and choose a few for the Q&A that it's gonna be at the end of the session. And we have also put in the chat a PDF with the agenda for today and the biographies of the different presenters. And finally, uh, this webinar is going to be recorded, uh, so it's going to be available at the ASFPM website um, probably uh, next month. So first of all, I just want to give a short introduction about ASFPM. So most of you are very or well, a little bit familiar about what UC Berkeley is, but maybe not about uh, ASFPM. So. The Association of uh, State Floodplain Managers is a scientific and educational nonprofit organization with more than 7,000 individual members dedicated to reducing flood losses in the nation. And its mission is to promote education policies and activities that mitigate current and future losses, costs, and human suffering caused by flooding. The International Committee is a platform to exchange knowledge at a global level and to discuss the best practices on wise use of floodplains in order to reduce flood losses, manage water resources and promote sustainability in the built and natural environment. 
we are structured um, with, um, let's say, different um, blocks. I, I don't know how to, to say. So we have two co-chairs, which is David and I. Then we have seven regional coordinators who are ASFPM members who are experts on different uh, areas in the world. And then we have, of course, the ASFPM members that are interested in the international committee. So our three main activities are to identify emerging topics in our web meetings. We share experiences through ASFPM webinars, newsletters, and conferences. And finally, we connect across countries, especially at the ASFPM conference when we can meet in person. So uh, now we are going to start with the first presenter, Ioannis Cavadas, who uh, works at the Water Unit at the European Commission. And he is going to give us some, um, some thoughts about the lessons learned after the two cycles of implementation of the Floods Directive. For those of you who are not very familiar with the Floods Directive, this is a law at the European level that has to be implemented for all member states. And it's a very simple approach. It's only three steps. So all member states had to do a flood risk assessment at a river basin scale. It was very innovative. Um, then they had to identify areas of potential and significant flood risk. And for these areas, they had to do not only flood hazard maps, but also flood risk maps. And the final steps was to create a flood risk management plan. So um, as you can see, it's very different from the national flood insurance program um, that we have in the US. Um, but apart from the European Flood Directive, each member state had their own flood policy before. So today we are gonna learn a little bit about how this has, um, what they have learned from it, but also other um, tools that are part of the national approaches for flood risk management. So with that, I'm gonna uh, move to Ioannis. Thank you, thank you, Jeroen, and thank you, Anna, for the introduction and the, and the uh, good morning to our friends in the United States and good afternoon to our, our friends in the, in, in the EU. I'm going to start sharing my presentation. Give me a second, please. Share, okay. Okay, so I'm I'm Yanis uh, Kavadas. I'm a, a policy officer and team leader in the European Commission. Uh, and uh, one of the areas I'm active in is, uh, as as Anna said, the the implementation of the floods directive uh, in the European Union. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about uh, about the EU, about uh, the Commission, and then uh, after a brief introduction or elaboration on one on what Anna said already about the floods directive, I'm going to move to some of our findings from the implementation of the of the floods directive. And of course, I'm available after the after the presentation, or you, you will also find my email at the end of the the, fit, after the final slide. You can you can contact me afterwards as well if you have specific things you would like to discuss. So the European Commission, uh, the European Commission is uh, one of the three, let's say, main, if I may say so, institutions on the basis of which the European Union uh, works and coordinates its, its business. So we have the EU, EU citizens voice, which is the European Parliament. We have the, we have the, the governments, uh, EU governments, the member states voice, which is the council. And then we have also the executive, uh, which is the European, uh, the European Commission. So the European Commission has uh, four roles. Uh, the right of initiative, that means, uh, let's say, generally speaking, it is the, the only of the three institutions which can introduce a, a bill, so propose new legislation. It has policy and budget implementation. It is the guardian of the treaties. The treaties are the primary law 
on which the whole edifice of the European Union rests. Uh, and then also we are responsible for, for taking further the international dimension or promoting the international dimension. Uh, there, are, there is a division of competences within the EU and uh, the, whatever powers the, the European Commission has in terms of uh, uh, proposing new law and uh, implementing or making sure that the law is implemented is uh, given to it by, by the treaties. There are three, uh, three modes of, uh, of operation. Uh, there is exclusive competence where the Commission uh, can take decisions, uh, let's say, unita unilaterally, for example, on trade and competition. Of course, the Member States have given to the Commission this power. There is a shared competence where the Commission is taking decisions together with the member states, for example, agriculture and, and environment. Environment is the area where I am active. Uh, so I'm an employee of, a, of the Directorate General for Environment in the European Commission. And then there is also supporting competencies like tourism and education, where the European Commission plays a rather coordinating and supporting role. Uh, we, we mentioned already uh, the treaties, which is the, let's say, the, the primary, primary law in the EU, and then we also have secondary and tertiary, tertiary legislation, but let's focus quickly on the secondary legislation, uh, which is regulations, directives and decisions, and then there is all those, those three are binding. And then there is also a non-binding element with the recommendations, for example, on economic governance. So focusing on the directives, the directives are setting out goals that the EU countries must achieve. So they are largely, let's say they are building the framework, but it is then for the individual member states to find out how to reach the objectives enshrined in the law. So in our case, we are, we are talking about the floods directive. So here you, here you have it, it's a, it's a, it's a framework building dire directive. And it uh, showed in 2007 when it was introduced after a very catastrophic floods in, uh, in Europe to, to do exactly that. So to establish a framework uh, for the assessment and management of flood risks. And the aim was to reduce the adverse consequences uh, from, uh, from flooding. Uh, on four aspects, on human health, on environment, cultural heritage, and economic activity. And uh, as uh, Anna said, it took actually a textbook uh, approach to, to risk management. So identify, evaluate, and react to risk. And this is done in six yearly repetitive cycles to account for the changing nature of, uh, of risk. So we have the preliminary flood risk assessments, the flood hazard and risk maps, and the flood risk management plans. And uh, we have been through uh, two cycles of implementation of the floods directive. Uh, and we are currently in the, in the, in the, in the um, implementation in the phase of implementing the first flood risk management plans. And this phase covers uh, the period between 2016 and 2021. So as of 2021, uh, the implementation of the second flood risk management plans will start. Uh, but but uh, in, the, in the European Union, uh, there is a requirement uh, for all legislation, all directives or regulations, they need to be subjected to an evaluation. So uh, from uh, time to time, we need to go back and make sure that the, that the laws that are in place are actually uh, fit for purpose. They are, they are delivering what they were supposed to deliver when they were introduced. So if, during those fitness checks or evaluations, we are looking at the uh, five dimensions. So effectiveness, uh, are we achieving what we were supposed to, what we set out to achieve? Efficiency, is it being achieved with, uh, with the right level of effort uh, or is there waste? Uh, coherence, making sure that, uh, that uh, two, three, four, ten pieces of legislation are, are working uh, together without, uh, without overlaps or without contradictions. Uh, relevance, so what we introduced uh, in 2007 or in 2000 or in 1980, is it still relevant because the circumstances change? And of course, because we are working at the EU level, the European Commission, but also uh, 
the member states in our coordination is there eu added value because the idea is to bring eu added value to the table uh, so we carried out a fitness check uh, we started in 2017 we concluded at the end of 2019 so pretty recently um, and the whole idea before be, behind this uh, better regulation agenda uh, of which uh, carrying out evaluations of uh, legal instruments is, is only a, a part is to be open and transparent in, transparent in terms of uh, decision making in terms of introducing and maintaining laws uh, giving the citizens and the stakeholders an opportunity to contribute uh, throughout the policy and law making process because uh, all those evaluations uh, include uh, a public consultation and an expert consultation uh, for four, three, four, five, six months, depending on the on the subject. Uh, making sure that uh, wherever EU is active, this is based on evidence and understanding of the facts and the impacts. And also, last but definitely not least, uh, looking at the regulatory burden on businesses, citizens, and administrations, which of course everyone wants to keep at a at a minimum. So on this slide, you see the let's say two headline conclusions of the fitness check. Uh, on the one hand, uh, not surpri not surprisingly, perhaps we found out that it is uh, early. Uh, to measure the actual risk reduction, which, as we said earlier, was the the aim. Uh, it is the main aim, let's say, of, uh, of the floods directive. Uh, but our analysis has shown that the flood risk management has greatly improved over the years across the EU since the introduction of the floods directive. And we also see that further efforts uh, need to need to be expended in in order to uh, strengthen the awareness and improve the coordinated uh, a coordinated response to uh, to ex ex a changing climate. I, I'm uh, making I'm I'm making a parenthesis here. Uh, as we were saying just now, we were saying that uh, more work more work needs to be done in the area of climate change. Uh, we are about the EU is about or the European Commission is about to introduce uh, its new strategy on uh, adaptation. Uh, in, we expect this to be in uh, two or three months, so in early 2021. Uh, we want to strengthen our efforts on uh, on climate uh, proofing, resilience building, prepare, prevention and preparedness. So those are also aims of the floods directive in any case. Uh, direct public and private investments uh, to the goal just uh, mentioned. We want to see more done in nature-based solutions, so no regret measures. And we are also want to be uh, we want to engage everyone, uh, not only the citizens, uh, but also the businesses, uh, insurers, investors, uh, and the cities as a, as, a, as a whole. So we want to improve access to climate relevant data. To this would lead to better decision making, better mo models, better forecasting, more awareness. Uh, and also to strengthen the, the integration of climate change into risk management uh, practices uh, across the board. So, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the new adaptation strategy will improve knowledge of climate impacts, reinforce planning and climate risk management, and accelerate action with a focus on uh, and here's the difference but compared to the previous to the existing adaptation strategy we want to have a focus on on solutions on innovation implementation and, pre and prevention so we want to become uh, more concrete uh, in our objectives compared to the previous uh, adaptation strategy so how how would the landscape of flood risk management uh, look without the floods directive of course we can only hypothesize because the flood directive is a, is a, is a reality, but uh, we can be certain that there would be civil protection cooperation in place uh, between groups of member states or between neighboring member states. Uh, there would be a fund to help rebuild, rebuild uh, after disasters. There would be regional uh, cooperation and the rural development uh, funds, uh, which exist uh, as well. Uh, we are sure there will be research on floods. There are many renowned institutions in the EU which are conducting such uh, research. Uh, international river commissions would be in place and also national measures for sure to, uh, to pre prepare, uh, prevent and uh, prepare the population uh, in terms of uh, natural disasters. 
Um, there would also likely be a, a more of a disaster driven emergency response. There would be for sure uh, islands of uh, excellence in terms of uh, flood risk management in the, in the EU or within uh, river basins. Uh, there would be also at the same time uh, less coordination and cooperation between member states. Uh, there would be clusters of member states cooperating perhaps, and there would be less consideration of uh, objectives of other environmental uh, legislation. A slide to show the difference between uh, the outputs, the outcomes and the impacts that we envisage uh, to gain from the implementation of the floods directive. So we have the outputs already in place. We have the implementation uh, on a solid ground. We have outcomes already in place. So we have seen changes to flood management processes and we have seen improvements uh, across the board. And now we are looking to, to also achieve uh, the impacts. So flood risk reduction, uh, obviously a reduction in the adverse consequences. So let's, let's look at the five elements of the fitness check uh, in turn. So in terms of uh, starting from the, let's say the first one, effectiveness, uh, we moved from a, from a local approach to a comprehensive flood risk management. Governance structures and processes have been uh, improved. Responsibil clearer or cre clear responsibilities have been assigned to specific authorities. So there is uh, responsibility to act and to plan. Uh, there is more information around, there is a lot of knowledge sharing, and there is standardization of terms to a degree. Uh, Flood-related policy, since there is reference to, a, to a, a, an instrument, the flood directive that has to be implemented, has been elevated within decision-making sphere, so within the member states and uh, within the Commission as well. The approach to funding has become one of a longer term perspective, uh, as opposed to a reactionary approach uh, with the funds being made available only after disasters. And there has been an improved coordination and cooperation between the relevant entities. So let's say between civil protection uh, and, the, and the flood risk managers. In terms of efficiency, we found that the cost-benefit ratios of measures uh, are favorable. Uh, the administrative burden seems to be, or is estimated to be moderate, speaking of the administrative burden that was imposed by the introduction and the need to implement the floods directive. Uh, there is, of course, a reporting element from the member states to the commission, where also we found, it was found that the benefits uh, are exceeding the costs. And uh, there was also a, a drive to simplify the reporting. So the information, the flow of information between the member states and the commission, we have made already steps in this direction. Maybe we need to see whether further steps need to be done. In terms of uh, coherence, the floods directive was found to support the Sendai framework disaster risk reduction. So there is a, at the EU level, uh, a, a, a support in terms of uh, 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 organizing uh, dis di risk disaster uh, response, uh, introducing the structures. There is a, a contribution to several of the sustainable development goals. Um, the members, the, the, the flood risk management plans and all the assessment, the assessments and the mapping that the member states are carrying out are becoming an input uh, to the general national risk assessments that the member states are doing, uh, which uh, national risk assessments concern not only uh, natural disasters of all sorts, but also man-made disasters. Uh, but we have also found that there is scope for better integration. So with areas like agriculture, land use, insurance, and of course we are, we, we are pursuing these, uh, these uh, these areas uh, that need further integration. Uh, in terms of relevance, uh, it's not new that floods are costly. It was found that they are the largest source of GDP losses. I mean, in, the, in Europe, we, we don't have frequently uh, the disasters that some, sometimes we, we see taking place in other parts of the globe, but we do have uh, 
uh, large floods from time to time, and we also have uh, floods which are uh, which are repetitive. So there needs to be a response. Um, in terms of uh, population exposed to uh, flooding, uh, we we expect a doubling, even if the global warming stays at uh, below two degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, the public considers flooding as a priority threat, which is which is important. I mean, there is awareness. Uh, the, the the directive has mot has uh, has uh, motivated closer international cooperation. Uh, it has also provided a framework, or it has focused minds, let's say, also in the in the international river basin commissions. And also, it is uh, it is uh, the the EU water policy uh, at large uh, plays an important role in the uh, in the international cooperation agenda of the of the EU. In terms of EU added value, uh, we have seen it in the transboundary ma management of uh, of uh, water and of uh, flood risk. We have we operate uh, an EU level platform, the Common Implementation Strategy. Uh, to coordinate uh, water management and also flood risk management, which has been valued as a, as, a, as very positive. Uh, minimum requirements have ensured that the progress within the 27 member states is at a comparable level uh, and happens within set time periods. We, we've seen that a good practice approach has been introduced in flood risk management and there is a uh, improvement in the planning across the EU. There is also an exchange of information. We see that something that uh, that is taking place in one country uh, attracts the interest of other countries, and there is then discussion and uh, cross fertilization, let's say. And also, the the directive has introduced uh, a public a, a blanket requirement in the whole of the EU for for flood risk management plans. Uh, to undergo a public consultation period. Uh, there are, of course, uh, challenges, uh, like with every every venture. So we are we are we need to find a way uh, to measure the distance to the objective that every every member state has set for itself in terms of uh, risk risk reduction. Uh, where money is uh, almost never enough, so funding of measures for the longer term or for the medium term is an issue. Uh, we need to find a way to take a stock or better stock of uh, losses from actual flood events, so from flooding that has uh, happened already. Uh, we would want to have more accurate uh, flood forecasting and uh, modeling, particularly for flash floods. We would like to understand the urban floods better and be able to predict them uh, more accurately. Uh, we need to improve our uh, incorporation of, uh, of uh, climate change into the longer term impact uh, of climate change on, on flooding. And we also would like to see uh, nature-based solutions uh, having a, a being better represented uh, in terms of uh, risk prevention and uh, protection within the planning of uh, within flood risk management plans, including, of course, a, a, a more quantitative analysis, perhaps a better understanding of how the costs and the benefits uh, look like. And I believe this is it. Uh, several opportunities to keep in touch and uh, my email here in the end. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Joannis. So we can move to the next presenter, uh, Kimo Slager, who's gonna talk about um, the flood risk map portal in the Netherlands. Hello. Um, I share my screen in a good way, yeah. Uh, hello, my, chemo, uh, my name is Kimo Slager, and I'm a senior advisor working at, uh, at Del Taris, which is an uh, independent knowledge institute in the Netherlands on uh, subsurface and water, uh, uh, and water. And I've been now for, yeah, uh, from the start, basically, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, very much involved as an advisor for the implementation of the flood directive in the, in the Dutch uh, context. 
And um, this presentation is on behalf of the uh, uh, of all the partners in, in the Netherlands, which uh, uh, on flood risk, and it is the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management, uh, the National Executive Agency Rijkswaterstaat, uh, regional water authorities, provinces, and sa safety regions. Um, uh, today, uh, in my short talk, I will try to touch upon a couple of uh, topics related to flood risk in the Netherlands, and specifically in the context of the European Flood Directive. Um, first, a quick overview on flood risk in the Netherlands uh, is presented then how we have organized our flood risk uh, management. Um, and for supporting uniform flood risk assessments throughout the country and reporting towards Europe, uh, the Netherlands have an elaborate information system in place that's called the Flood Risk Mapping Portal. And um, I finalized with some main lessons drawn from the second uh, cycle implementation round. Um, the Netherlands um, has experienced a couple of severe floods in the last century. Uh, fortunately, in the last two decades, it uh, there were not so much uh, severe floods. Um, the characteristics of these events are, uh, are mentioned in the overview table. And the coastal flood uh, with sea dike breaches in 1916, uh, which was in this area of the Netherlands, um, fortunately with only 20 casualties, uh, but led to a very important construction, the what we call uh, yeah, the sea barrier, the Ashlight dike, uh, and as a result in combination with a large freshwater reservoir, the Isle Lake. In the, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the red uh, uh, corner. Uh, 10 years later, um, a relatively large river flood led to a large river and back to the force was along the, uh, the main rivers, the Rhine and, and the Isle rivers. And uh, I think the most famous flood for the Netherlands is the 1953 coastal flood uh, with a lot of dike breaches uh, in, in this part of the Netherlands, in the southwestern part. Um, which, which, which had a lot of casualties, a lot of uh, uh, damage for that time, 1.5 billion euros, and, and led basically to the, to the famous Delta Works, uh, large sea barriers uh, throughout uh, along the, the North Sea coast. Um, in 1993 and 1995, we had some uh, um, yeah, floodplain floods in the, in the rivers again, um, led to some considerable dam damage and a lot of evacuation ba evacuations, basically, 275,000 evacuations. But in the end, uh, no dike breaches happened. So, um, yeah, everybody was safe, but there was quite some damage. And this basically led to, um, yeah, the nature-based solutions, what we call room for the river, but also in combination with uh, enforcement of embankments. And last but not least, in 1998, um, we, we came across uh, yeah, a kind of different type of flooding um, where we uh, 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 it had a different mechanism. It was basically a large scale regional uh, drainage congestion after long periods of rain uh, where we had uh, problems to, uh, to store and, and drain and pump the water out of our, uh, of our polder systems. And uh, that, that led actually to a huge uh, amount of, uh, of agricultural damage mainly. Um, this is the Netherlands. The Netherlands is 60% uh, uh, of the country is flood prone. And just to give you an idea, um, the Netherlands is just one tenth of the size of the state of California. Um, and so we are quite a small country, uh, around 40,000 square kilometers. And, uh, but 60% of the country is flood prone. Um, where uh, 10 million, two thirds of the total population, and and more than two thirds of the the national uh, the, the GDP is is earned. Um, fortunately, uh, uh, these floods have very low probabilities, um, and uh, due to uh, to comprehensive protection schemes, and also last decade supported with spatial planning regulations and uh, and disaster and effective crisis response and disaster management. Hey, Kimo, can I uh, stop you for just a second? Somebody's yeah. recording the, uh, I think maybe part of your Zoom doc is overlaying your um, presentation. Ah. It's creating a, a mask here. Annoying. Yeah. Uh, let me see how I do this. Um, I can probably minimize you and myself. There you go. This is probably better. Better? M much better. Yeah. Thank you. My apologies. Yes. Um, 
So, but we, we find that still in the, in, the, in the current situation and in the future, uh, we estimate that the most extreme credible fluvial floods, so from rivers, uh, could be uh, give some like 50 billion euro damage, uh, more than 1 million people affected directly and uh, more than 3,000 casualties. And uh, yeah, from coastal floods, uh, even though the probabilities are very low, um, yeah, this can give significant uh, um, uh, problems uh, uh, with large damages and a lot of people affected and, and killed. Um, here you see uh, a, a, a land use map basically uh, in the flood prone area where you see basically the largest cities of Amsterdam and Rotterdam and The Hague, so uh, uh, yeah, the Randstad and, and also other, other uh, large uh, economic centers. Um, at this moment, we have a comprehensive multi-level uh, multi governance on flood risk management in the Netherlands uh, with a Ministry of Infrastructure and Water, uh, mainly responsible for, uh, for the policy guidelines. And in the context, context of the flood directive, uh, responsible for implementation and reporting. Um, uh, below that, or in the same ministry, basically, there is a strong uh, national implementing agency, Rijkswaterstaat, which is responsible for managing the national water system, <clears throat> which are basically the, the coast, uh, coastal zone, the large uh, rivers and the large, uh, large lakes. Um, and at regional levels, uh, we have uh, uh, yeah, institutionalized regional water authorities, uh, which are um, managing the regional water systems. Uh, including embankments and hydraulic structures. Um, we have municipalities. They, uh, they are responsible for, uh, for local planning and water management and provinces, uh, which you do supervise both authorities in managing the water. And finally, but not least, uh, we also uh, included also in the flood directive, but also in flood risk management in general, the 25 safety regions, which are responsible for evacuation planning and uh, disaster response uh, implementation. Um, flood risk management in the, in the Netherlands is based basically on three main principles. Um, flood defenses, uh, we call that also the, the multi-layer safety approach. Uh, the first layer is what we call flood defenses. The second layer is uh, a spatial planning for the active flood plains and spatial planning for the, uh, yeah, the protected areas and uh, crisis management, including evacuation. Uh, and we work on the principles of, uh, of river basin approaches, so transboundary, but also within the country, uh, making sure that the interventions upstream and downstream to mitigate flood risk are in balance. And a good example of long year uh, cooperation is within the Rhine Basin uh, through the International Commission for the Protection of the Rhine, uh, where six member states participate and um, uh, yeah, uh, this coordination includes aligned and coordinated flood risk management plans, uh, a combined effort in uh, increasing flood awareness across the basin, uh, improvements and, and uh, the maintenance of a system of flood forecasting. Um, there's also room for proposals and, and execution of joint research uh, within such a basin and also the impact of climate change is, uh, is very important to, uh, to investigate in this, uh, in this river basin. On a national level, we had a, a, an, yeah, an important, or we, we are in an important phase uh, um, where in the last decade, a large national, national Delta program uh, was started. And this was started to prepare the country for the, for the future, uh, the uncertain future with regards to integrated flood risk management climate adaptation and uh, integrated water resources management. Um, a couple of uh, Ds are involved here. Uh, the first one, which is uh, the legal instrument, is the Delta Act. Uh, the Delta Act is brought into place to arrange that the Delta Commissioner, that's a person uh, who leads a, a commission and, and, and yeah, leads the overall, the national formulation and execution of, uh, of the Delta program. The Delta program, um, uh, and, and, and this, this Delta Commission needs to, uh, to yearly report on the progress of the program to the to Parliament. And the financial contribution is, is arranged legally in a Delta fund with a guaranteed budget of, uh, of around 1, 1. 1.25 billion euros a year until 2032, uh, so uh, the coming 12 years. Um, one of the main objectives 
of the Delta program with regards to flood risk management was the renewing of the flood protection standards for the embankments in the Netherlands. And uh, these flood protection standards are risk informed with one of the main objectives to minimize the probability to, to, to die from flooding, uh, what we call annual fatality risk. And uh, this annual fatality risk needs to be uh, uniformly uh, distributed within the country to be less than once in 100,000 year to be killed by a flood. And here you see two maps where you see the, the current situation. Uh, uh, so somewhere in uh, everywhere in the Netherlands, you uh, uh, can 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 say what is the probability to, 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 to drown. And given the implementation measures, including spatial planning and disaster response, um, we are working towards this 2050 goal where uh, we have this uh, objective uh, um, reached. Specifically to the flood uh, directive, but also uh, for all this uh, uh, manage, uh, management and planning purposes, um, uh, the Netherlands maintain a central information system uh, where flood hazard and risk uh, information is, uh, is managed. One of the central elements is a central uh, database, a national database with thousands of, uh, of flood simulations uh, from flood models um, maintained by the different uh, governments involved, uh, like Rijkswaterstaat, like the regional uh, water authorities and, and the provinces. Um, this central storage is accessible through a web portal where these organizations can upload and manage their information. And there is a minimum quality control uh, on these simulations and the resulting flood and hazard and risk maps uh, in three ways. Um, first, there are guidelines, uh, minimal guidelines with, with minimal requirements uh, are provided for everyone. Um, Deltaris, as an in independent institute, uh, act as a kind of gatekeeper for the central database, verifying the uploaded results, uh, as well as supporting the selection of flood simulations to be used for the for the flood hazard mapping uh, and risk maps, uh, given the return periods. Um, this compilation and, and unifying process is automated so that this becomes uh, manageable, reproducible for the future. And uh, last but not least, the third one is uh, that it is verified by, uh, by responsible government organizations on the resulting flood hazard and risk maps. This system and organization makes it possible to update the flood hazard and risk maps uh, very frequently uh, every year. Um, the results from this uh, from this portal, uh, yeah, it, it, the, the, the flood maps, flood hazard maps, like water depth maps, but also risk maps and, and supporting information is, um, is published uh, on an official platform for risk information in the Netherlands, which is called, uh, yeah, riskmap.nl, risicocards.nl, um, where among other uh, natural hazards, uh, flood hazard and risk maps are published for the broader public. Uh, this is all considered open data and is easily accessible also on, from other portals, uh, from different uh, platforms and also for different users. Uh, as such, we have also, for example, a mobile app to increase public awareness with flood risk information up to the to the address, postal address level. Um, but the most important uh, with, with this uh, in this regard is that uh, the information uh, provided at the different uh, portals and locations and websites is up to date and refer to the same source, this national database with simulations and, uh, and derived maps. The same information we uh, we use uh, together with uh, with our international partners for for example the Rhine Basin, uh, building a, a a web viewer on flood risk in the Rhine Basin, and here you see the result, where exactly the same information is used to uh, to show cross border flood hazard and risk information and. Working together actually on this uh, on, on, on such a such a portal gives enormous insight in the different approaches uh, applied throughout the countries, uh, but also the knowledge and information applied in the different countries. Um, what is important regarding this flood risk mapping portal is that it is operated and maintained. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, actors in, in the Netherlands working uh, and, uh, together in this uh, flood risk mapping portal. These are provinces uh, which are responsible by law to publish these natural hazard and risk uh, maps at a public website. Um, but they are also owner of flood models and provider of model results. Uh, regional water authorities, they are, uh, yeah, they own hydraulic structures and, and operate and maintain them. So they are exactly the ones who know the, 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 the area. 
uh, the ministry and, and the implementing agency Rijkswaterstaat and uh, the safety regions who are primar primarily a user uh, for disaster response planning. Um, Delta Airs is, uh, is part of this team as well uh, for, the, for the quality control. Um, my last slide is on uh, some lessons learned for the second cycle from the flood directive in the Netherlands. Uh, mainly, uh, we have in the second cycle uh, included uh, all the objectives and, and, and incorporated the, the Delta program uh, in, in, in the flood directive uh, reporting. Um, that's a major step, and uh, yeah, that, that basically uh, yeah, that, that updates our, uh, our policies and our planning, uh, national planning into the flood directive. Um, a second important lesson is the uh, information exchange we have in these trans transboundary river basins like the Rhine, but also the Meuse, the, the Scheldt and the, and the, e the Ames um, are, is very important uh, uh, to be continuous in order to, and it's important that it is continuous, continuous and uh, in order to learn from each other approaches data and information used and, uh, and formulating joint, uh, joint knowledge proposals to improve the knowledge. Um, and the last one is, is on the sources of flooding. I think the Netherlands is well prepared uh, and, and has a lot of history on, on managing large scale and uh, uh, local scale fluvial and, and coastal flooding. Uh, but more and more in the, in the current uh, times and, and also uh, uh, yeah, with, with regards to climate change, uh, we see that also smaller scale fluvial and urban flooding events, uh, also as they are perceived by our inhabitants, they become more important and, and more hazardous. And in the second cycle, we have performed some preliminary uh, national assessments, but uh, did, not con did not yet consider it as a, a potential significant risk. Um, and at this moment, for the third cycle in preparation for it, we, uh, uh, we assemble a local information from nationalized urban stress testing. And we have to see for the third round whether uh, this gives reason to include uh, it in our areas uh, of potential significant flood risk and then uh, that, it, that it may become uh, more prominent in the implementation of the flood directive. Um, these are uh, my contact details, and I like to uh, to to mention that uh, Jan Kruishoop, uh, uh, my uh, yeah, uh, my colleague from Rijkswaterstaat, uh, also in the audience today, actually uh, can also be approached on uh, on the flood directive implementation in the Netherlands. And we like to express uh, that both Rijkswaterstaat but also Deltaars uh, are very interested in in guidance uh, of of students uh, yeah, in in topics in relation to flood risk management uh, and knowledge. I think this is important also to stress the, uh, yeah, the, the importance to, to, to keep uh, the relation with, uh, uh, in this network uh, alive and, and to really build upon uh, knowledge uh, from each other. That was my presentation. Thank you very much, Kimo. And uh, now we are gonna move to um, Mark Asamson from the Office of Public Works in Ireland, who's gonna talk about uh, this new national risk assessment and mapping program that has been developed in Ireland. Well, he's getting set up. Um, I just want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, um, I know there's a lot of new material here for a lot of people, so feel free to um, put comments and questions in here. We have reserved a, a fair amount of time, I think about a half hour at the end for, uh, for questions. Okay, thank you. I hope my screen is sharing there, is it? Yes? Yes, it's, it's okay. Okay, that's great, I'll go on. Um, so good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everybody, um, as was said earlier. Um, so my name is Mark Adamson. I'm head of the Flood Relief and Risk Management Division in the Office of Public Works um, that I'll introduce in a second. Um, uh, so I'm a pleasure of being um, involved with the Floods Directive since the, at the outset about 15 years ago. So as, as was introduced, I'm going to talk about um, the risk damage, uh, risk damage and benefit assessment across multiple sectors um, in flood risk management in, in Ireland. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, 
I had the pleasure of presenting to the association at your conference um, back in June of 2009 in Orlando. Um, so slightly different circumstances here today doing things through screen and also because it's uh, certainly a lot, lot colder in December in Ireland than it was in June in Florida. Just to introduce the Office of Public Works, um, we were founded back in 1831 and are now a office within a central government department. Um, Historically, we would have been responsible for building and managing a, a, a whole range of different public works, um, including roads, um, ports. But since the middle of the last century, um, we would have focused on land drainage um, to improve agricultural land production. This changed about 25 years ago when our focus shifted to urban flood protection. And then about 15 years ago, that was broadened out again to adopt a, a more holistic approach to flood risk management involving prevention, preparedness and resilience, um, as well as protection. And through that policy, we developed the, the concept of the National CFRAM program. Um, and this and the policy review overall were very well aligned with the EU floods directive that came out subsequently in 2007. Um, and the CFRAM program that I'll speak about shortly um, has been our, our main vehicle for delivering on many of the requirements of the, the directive. But just before I speak, start speaking about that, I'll just give you a, an indication of what floods look like in Ireland. Um, this is Cork City, Ireland's second large, largest city. I'm down in the southwest of the country back in November of uh, 2009, um, when the River Lee burst its banks. Um, and this will be typical of the, the kind of urban flooding that we, we, we can see on occasion around the country. Um, and we have a major flood relief scheme currently being developed for, for Cork um, at a cost of in excess of a, 100 million euros of, of implementation. And then this will also be quite a common site, uh, particularly in the winters around Ireland. Um, this is the River Shannon a few years ago, um, when large areas of agricultural land um, go underwater during um, our, our wet winters that, that, we, that we often have. So to talk about the National CFRAM program, um, this was a very comprehensive um, program of assessment. Um, we looked at the risk in 300 uh, areas for further assessment, as we call them. Um, these were the communities at potentially significant risk. Um, and I say the program is comprehensive because these communities are home to over 3 million people. Um, Ireland's a small country, so that 3 million people represents about two thirds of our entire national population. And the study involves detailed, dynamically linked 1D, 2D modeling um, of about 7,000 kilometers of river and 90 coastal communities um, and the production of flood maps for a range of flood event magnitudes. Um, eight flood event magnitudes were looked at in total from very minor frequent events up to very extreme, very rare events. Um, with a range of different types of flood maps um, produced. Um, most, of these, most of this information has been provided um, to the public through uh, floodinfo.ie. Um, this is an interactive GIS portal um, through which users can move around, zoom in and out, um, to look at the flood maps and different types of flood maps, look at the flood risk management measures which are proposed or in hand or completed, and we're continually adding elements to this, um, such as we've migrated over, for example, our database on past floods. So we have information on almost 6,000 past floods dating back to the 18th century, I think. Um, and those records have been moved into floodinfo.ie as well. Um, and just a flag that under the CFAM program, obviously we looked at the current scenario, but we also looked at potential future scenarios taking account of the potential impacts of climate change. Um, so these assessments were also undertaken for what we call the mid-range and the high-end future scenarios with allowances for mean sea level rise and increases in peak fluvial flood flows as indicated there. And this included a flood hazard assessment and also risk assessments. Um, but just to give you an example of the potential impacts of climate change, um, this, is a, a this, is, this map represents what would be a, a major coastal flood event under current conditions um, in the city of Limerick, which is our third biggest city, again down in the southwest. Um, so that's with existing mean sea level. And this will be the same then with a meter of sea level rise. 
So under the high end of future scenario. So you can see that the areas inundated um, uh, are extended quite significantly. Um, so then as well as looking at the hazard, we looked at the, the risk, um, the, the impacts, and therefore the potential benefits of addressing that risk. Um, and this was looked at in terms of the economic damages, but also the range of assets that could potentially be affected um, in, 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 by floods. So looking at these two tables, the one on the left is for a town in the west of Ireland called Bananaslo that is subject to fluvial flood risk. Um, and then the one on the right is for the city of Limerick, um, which I showed earlier, which is prone to coastal flood risk. And each of these tables is divided into three sections. Um, moving down, you have the current scenario, mid-range and high end, um, with different types of impacts assessed um, under each scenario. And then moving across the columns, um, different magnitudes event of event from a 10% annual exceedance probability or a 10-year flood to a 1% the 0.1% annual exceedance probability, which would be a very extreme flood. And just to give you an indication of the potential impacts of climate change there, um, in the event of a 1% or a 100-year flood happening in Ballina Slow today, um, the event damage will be in the order around 10 million euros. And that would approximately double um, if we look at the, the high-end future scenario figure there. Moving across to Limerick, which is a, a much larger city, um, in the event of a, a, a major flood event there today, again, our flood damages might be in the order of around 80 million euros for one flood event. But that would increase to over a billion euros of damages um, in the event of the same type of event happening, but with a meter of sea level rise. Um, and these tables provide uh, an indication of the risk, damage and benefit assessments that were undertaken as part of the CFRAM programme. And this has informed the options and measures we've looked at to, to address the flood risk problem in each community and catchment and the appraisal to determine the most appropriate measure in each case. These appraisals included environmental assessments, so what we call strategic environmental assessment and an appropriate assessment under the Habitats Directive. Um, an economic assessment or a cost benefit analysis and a multi-criteria analysis or an MCA. I won't have time to go into the environmental assessments here today, but I will touch and expand on what we did in relation to the other two. So firstly, just in relation to the economic appraisal, um, the purpose of this was to inform the appraisal and the selection of measures. So essentially to, to help try and identify the most economically advantageous measure that we could implement to address the flood risk in each catchment or community and also to provide the, the economic justification to demonstrate in terms of our, our, public, our spending of public money, um, that the benefits of the investment outweigh the costs of doing nothing or doing nothing more than we, we currently are. So a no change situation. Um, and this is based on looking at the damages uh, across a range of flood event magnitudes. So again, like we say, we looked at eight different magnitudes. We have assessed the damages um, for each annualize those um, and that, that's all based on what's called the UK Flood Hazard Research Centre multicolored manual. Um, this is some work that's been developed over the over a number of decades um, capturing information on the actual damages that have happened during flood events and also from a bottom-up analysis in terms of analyzing what damages um, a flood, flood event could occur for different debts um, for a range of different property types. So the, the MCM, the multicolor manual, as we call it, um, that provides a range of depth damage curves for a range of different property types. Um, and again, we can apply that then to derive our damages for each flood event, annualize those, and they're then discounted across the product horizon, which is for us is, is 50 years, to give us our net present value of damages, um, which in turn would be the net present value of benefits were we to um, address that, that risk. And that in turn informs the benefit cost ratio. We look at that net present value benefit relative to the whole life project costs of uh, an investment to, to manage or reduce flood risk. That has traditionally been the way we, we've addressed the economic appraisal. But we are currently reviewing this um, to try and enhance um, the, the assessment in terms of the occlusion 
of some of the intangible or indirect benefits that we don't already take into account. Um, so for example, trying to include in, in a monetary fashion, the impacts on human health, public realm, recreation, biodiversity improvements, and so on. So moving on then to the multi-criteria assessment. Um, the purpose of this was to inform the, the selection of options um, for uh, addressing the flood risk in each community um, through the assessment of options against a range of objectives. Now, the EU floods directive requires the, the member states to set out objectives um, aimed at the reduction of flood risk. Um, but a number of, a range of different approaches have been taken in, in different countries in interpreting this in terms of looking at it from a perspective of risk reduction, the implementation of sp specific measures to reduce risk, or the achievement of specific standards of protection. Um, in Ireland, then, we've set 18 objectives, or I think it's actually 15 objectives, and three of them are divided into two sub-objectives, so 18 sub-objectives in all. Um, which are based on the principle of risk reduction. Um, these were defined through pilot testing and stakeholder consultation um, and, and, a bit, and are broken down into four groups of, of object objectives um, across the social, economic, environmental and cultural sectors. And also with three additional uh, objectives relating to technical aspects of flood relief. Um, so the approach with regards to each objective, again, is essentially to reduce risk. Um, but for the environmental, it's more typically to avoid damages and promote other sectoral objectives or other to, to promote environmental objectives. Um, we have to recognize that not all of the objectives are equal. Um, I think many would recognize, for example, that, that the risk to people in particular, and also the risk to property, may be considered to be more important than some other objectives, such as, for example, the flooding of agricultural land or visual amenity. Um, but because these objectives are across a range of different sectors, they're very difficult to monetize. Um, but we need to find a way of weighting these. Um, and we did this by trying to reflect societal values. Um, so we undertook structured interviews with more than a thousand members of the public um, undertook statistical analysis to determine the weightings then um, based on th those interviews um, that we would give um, to the objectives within each group. And there's a paper that I'll provide a reference to at the end, which explains how, how that was done. But I'd emphasize that we did um, look at, use this method to look at the weightings within each group, um, but we did give equal weightings to each group. So we gave, for example, um, economy, society, and environment and cultural heritage equal weightings and then just weighted them within those groups. Um, that was to make sure that we maintained that equality in terms of the, the pillars of sustainable development. But also some objectives may be more relevant in some areas than others. Um, so we also introduced a system of local weightings. Um, this is to reflect the local relevance um, so for example, in some areas, we may have some key and critical transport infrastructure, but in others that, that isn't really a factor. So then there's a local weighting system to reflect how relevant some of these objectives are in the context of individual communities. And we have guidance for the applications of these weightings. And again, there's a reference for that at the end of the presentation. Um, so just to give you an example, um, this is uh, an extract from that um, guidance. Um, you can see we've set the, the criteria, the groups of social, economic, and environmental, um, looking at objectives of minimizing risk to human health and life, minimi minimizing risk to community, economic risk, transport infrastructure, and so on, supporting the objectives of the Water Framework Directive, which is a, around water quality, um, supporting the objective of habitats and biodiversity, um, and so on. And that goes on with the, the second part of the, the table there. But you can see on the right hand side the global weightings then which were given through the process of outline to each of those objectives. Um, so the MCA, the multi criteria analysis based around these objectives and the weightings um, were applied by scoring the various options or the various measures that we're considering um, as, as a means of addressing the flood risk in a given catchment or community. 
according to the degree to which that option goes towards meeting each of the objectives. And scoring those um, on a range of plus five to minus five, it could be any number, um, where plus five is obviously where it fully meets that particular objective, minus five where it does significant damage or increases the risk under that objective, with a minus 999 to effectively take an option off the table if it has unacceptable impacts. Um, and we apply this scoring and the global weightings and local weightings um, to each of those objectives that I flagged earlier. And these are then totaled up to give us an overall multi-criteria analysis score, which effectively is a representation of the benefit or impact of a particular measure on balance across all of the objectives all the societal, economic, and environmental and cultural objectives that, that we've flagged. And this then goes on to inform the selection of our preferred measures, um, along with the economic appraisal, but also very importantly, professional judgment. Um, this is a structured framework, um, and if it's, it, it, as with all structured frameworks, it can be prone to um, abnormalities coming through. I mean, in general, it proved very well. So the outcomes of the MCA and the professional judgment tended to align very well. And also very importantly, um, by local engagement and consultation. Um, this is obviously extremely important to ensure that any proposals for measures we want to be taking forward to address the flood risk for, for a community are of course acceptable to that community. We don't impose works on people. Um, so just to conclude, the outcomes then of this, this, this appraisal process, this assessment of risks, benefits and impacts, um, and the working through of that under our objectives to identify measures for flood risk management were all identified in the flood risk management plans um, that were referenced by Ioannis earlier on. Um, so these set out the strategy and measures for management of flood risk um, around Ireland. Um, with a large number of additional flood relief schemes um, to be implemented along with a range of non-structural measures. And I'm happy to say the government has have, have underpinned um, funding for this through the National Development Plan um, with a commitment to a billion euros for the period of 2018 to 2027. So just to conclude, um, these are the references I um, alluded to earlier. Um, the first is gives more detail around the MCA process the second on how we determine those global weightings. And the third then will give you access to the flood risk management plans if you want to see um, how, how they look. Um, I think the PDFs will be, of the presentations will be circulated afterwards. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Mark. So we will finish with the last presentation and then we can move to the Q&A that I see there are a lot of questions in the chat right now. So the last presenter is Clemens Nauhall. He's from the Federal Ministry of Agriculture, Regions and Tourism in Austria. And he's gonna present a tool that has been developed to calculate flood damages with a multi-hazard hazard criteria. So Hello everybody. Hi. I'm ready, are you? <laughs> Thanks yeah. for the welcoming words. Thanks for the opportunity to present on what we are doing in Austria uh, when it comes to mapping. I want to focus my presentation on a tool to assess exposure, not only for floods, but also for other natural hazards. And uh, the main goal, the main aim of this tool is also to raise awareness in the, uh, amongst the people living in Austria. We do have, um, Hazard information available in Austria on three spatial scales, addressing uh, different objectives and having different purposes. We do have it on a local level since the late 70s, 1970s. We do elaborate so-called hazard zone plans, which are in high detail. I will show a, a map uh, in the next slide. We do have maps on the regional level, uh, the flood hazard and risk maps, which also fulfill the requirements of the implementation of the floods directive. And we have on national level, the natural hazard overview and risk assessment Austria, which is the already indicated public private partnership together with the insurance sector in Austria. 
On the local level, um, we set up so-called hazard zone plans, which build upon the knowledge uh, uh, based on two-dimensional um, hydrodynamic flood modeling. Uh, we calculate out of the water depth and the flow velocity, the so-called intensity, and this is the basis for delineating hazard zones in settlements and outside to inform the people which are participating in this process on the hazard, on the exposure they are facing. Um, the expertise is being done and elaborated by the water managers and the information is applied in the frame of spatial planning, building regulation, and it also serves as uh, information for emergency managers when it comes to uh, set up uh, evacuation plans and so on. You see here uh, an example of a medium uh, municipality in Austria. Uh, you can see the high level of detail uh, which is incorporated to this uh, kind of maps. You see each and every property assigned to different colors. For instance, the yellow color indicates that there is a hundred years flood recurrence interval, but the intensity is not so high. The red color indicates that the intensity is high, so you can uh, you you have to face a high flow velocity or even also combined with high water depth. And we also indicate areas uh, behind dikes. Uh, in Austria, we try to protect uh, settlements against a hundred years flood. But we also indicate what happens if it's overtopped or if it fails by uh, the yellow red areas which account for a 300 years flood. So people are aware that there is not a total safety and they have to also adapt to this kind of flood by uh, object oriented um, measures by flood aware spatial planning and a lot of other measures. And we come, <clears throat> sorry, we come to the regional level. Um, it's also, of course, based on hydrodynamic modeling. However, as it covers roughly 40,000 kilometers in Austria, we are having around 100,000 river kilometers in Austria to deal with. Um, it's mostly based on also two-dimensional uh, two hydrodynamic modeling. It's uh, a tool for public information and awareness raising, but not of this high level of detail. We are trying there to um, be more uh, explanatory, to, to provide some tutorials, to bring the people uh, nearer to the, uh, to the process of flooding. And as already mentioned, it also serves for the implementation of the floods directive. For areas where there are hazard zone plans available, we of course use this information and transfer it into the um, flood hazard and risk maps. I will show you now some examples how we try to uh, bring this information to our public. We explain before they can access the maps, uh, some tutorials pop up. Um, so that they know what they see, then they can type in their, uh, the, the place where they are living and they get the information they want um, to have. So we explain what does um, the probability of flooding mean, what means a 30 years flood, a 100 years flood, what means the exposure, what means um, uh, water depth and flow velocity to them and how to behave in case that they are flooding. So you can see the inundation um, information on this side and some um, information on how to judge and how to behave in case of flooding on the right hand side of the slide. I'll, I, this is an example from a more alpine area. So we do have a lot of tributaries to the main river stem. You can see we inform the people about the recurrence intervals, the darker the color, the more likely the flood occurs. The dark color means a 30 years flood, the lighter color 100 years flood, 
like over here, and the really light color means this is a, a 300 years flood they have to cope with. We also provide this information on uh, different uh, water depths. So the, the darker color means up to 60 centimeters, the medium color up to 1.5 meters, and the light color beyond that. And the flow velocity, especially in the Alpine area, it's a very important uh, parameter as it also coincides with um, sediment transport and therefore a lot of energy in the, uh, in the events themselves, which also leads to, this, uh, to the destruction of buildings as well. So people should be aware uh, what hazard they are facing. Uh, second point, uh, besides the hazard, also the risk, or in this case, the exposure is a very important information we need to provide to the local level, the municipal level, but also the emergency managers. You can see here uh, an information on how many people are prone to flooding of different uh, recurrence intervals. So emergency managers can uh, plan where to go first in case of flooding. We also give some information about the land use in this area and also if there is interaction with uh, natural protection areas and um, areas of, of special interest. Now, uh, based on this information, we also have on national level since the early 2000, uh, I think since 2005, uh, the hazard information uh, and overview and risk assessment Austria. It tries to cover nearly the whole territory of Austria. So we have to also adapt some pragmatic approaches for areas where this detailed information is not available. Um, we also generalize the information. So it's a first uh, information for people providing information where to get better information afterwards. Um, as already mentioned, it's a public private partnership of the federal ministry I'm working at together with the insurance sector in Austria, which is also used then to calculate the insurance premiums in Austria as well. You can see here uh, the, the starting site of, of the horror system. We started in 2005 with some information on flooding. And as this tool proved to be uh, good and uh, well understandable, we, we added uh, different processes and hazards like hail or storm or, or uh, like like um, um, also alerting systems, snow cover, and so on and so forth. And here you see the information that is uh, provided by the implementation of the floods directive and the more pragmatic information that has been done um, in the aura system. This system currently is under revision, so it's been set up based on the state of the art. And we are trying to give a, a better feeling to the public what does flood hazard and flood risk mean. So you can see from the more pragmatic one-dimensional uh, modeling approach, we are now going to the two-dimensional approach for the whole area of Austria. Um, we also try to address uh, the hydrologic boundary conditions for ungaged catchments. Uh, there are a lot in the Alpen areas of Austria. Nearly 60% of Austria is uh, covered by Alpen areas. We also try to consider a residual risk behind dikes by eliminating all longitudinal structures uh, in the topographical information. So we have uh, the worst case scenario, scenario as well at hands and being able to uh, communicate that to the public that in case of uh, damage, in case of failure, um, there will be 
even more severe events in their municipality they are living. We also try to improve the topographical data, of course, and make it more interactive by providing um, live visualizations and uh, some examples for the people, which I will show in my last slide. This is the current developments uh, in future. And I'm talking here about the near future of the next two or three years. We are trying or we are aiming for the improvement of risk assessment. So in the near future, it shall be possible not only to have the exposure and the inundation areas, but also the inundation per building in the uh, inundation area. So you should be able then to incorporate some damage functions and assess the risk appropriately. It is also possible in the, in the software system, in the software surrounding to set up measures like sandbags shown here and assess the implications of the overall flood risk. It's more or less also a learning tool for emergency uh, managers how their uh, actions will impact the overall flood situation in the area they are dealing with. Um, what is very important but very difficult to calculate is how the drainage system behaves in case of flooding. So um, we do have this information at hand where the whole a drainage system runs, but we did not yet incorporate it to a hydrodynamic model. So this should be coupled then with the drainage system as well to not only have to inundation areas, but also the interactions when water comes out in areas of a city where it's not raining heavily. And of course, the incorporation of surface runoff uh, is a major goal <clears throat> for the further development of the system. I can show you here a short film before coming to my last slide, how this is being done dynamically in the uh, simulation, in the modeling of the overall system. You can see here always the implication by coloring the buildings, uh, which is in reference of the water depth, which is expected um, at uh, this building. So you'll see that there is a high uh, level of detail of the whole topography available, uh, which is then fed into the uh, model itself. And this is really um, important to say, this model is set up for the, all, uh, for the whole area of Austria, which covers more than 80,000 square kilometers. Coming to my last slide, um, the near future, hopefully, of this system will give you the option of choosing the area of interest and then receiving an information like that. So you'll see all tributaries are assessed by gauge information or the calculated hydrologic information, which is fed dynamically into the system. This can be um, chosen totally freely and everything that is in the range will be incorporated to your calculation and also in the delineation of the inundation areas as well in, as in the coloring of the buildings so that you know in the end what risk are you facing, where are your hotspots, and what you have to do when it comes to flood risk management. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Clemens. That was really interesting to see all these visualizations. Um, thank you, the three of you, for all these, uh, sharing all this knowledge about your countries. I think. We tackle a lot of the most hot topics in the US, which is climate change, zero risk behind levees, stormwater management, uh, and then of course, how we exchange knowledge uh, at a real business scale between different boundaries, administrative boundaries, either countries or states in the case of the US. These are all 
topics that uh, we still have to work a lot on the US and we can learn a lot from the EU. Um, I think that um, I just have one quick question before I give um, the, the word to David. Um, you mentioned that you have a lot of issues, Clemens, about sediment because of the orography of Austria. So do you use clear water models or do you take into account sediments when you work on fluid dynamic models? It depends. In the Alpine areas, of course, you have to also model uh, the sediment transport and you also have to model the overlay of tributaries with the main river stem. So you, you have in the, in, the, in the whole process of the uh, hazard zone plans, you have to set up worst case scenarios. So you model uh, sediment input from the tributary to the main river stem and you calculate what does that mean for the, uh, for the water level? What does that mean for bridges uh, when there is a jam? and uh, scenarios like that. So it, it clearly depends. We use okay. both in the end. Yeah, this is very interesting for us in California because we are having a lot of um, issues about floods after fires. This year has been um, especially severe in terms of uh, fire season. And so we expect to have some mud flows and debris flows in some areas of California because the rainy season is about to start. So um, I think this could be one of another big topic that we could develop in another, in another talk. But anyway, I'm gonna move to the Q&A. So David, uh, you can moderate this um, session and with this we will finish the, the webinar. Yep, that sounds good. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for, for some really good presentations and we do have a lot of questions in here. Um, and looks like some of them have been answered as we go. So uh, if I say something here that has been answered somewhere down in there, just, you know, you can point out uh, that it's, that there's an answer, you know, or a link or something in the, in the uh, comments, which the comments will also be posted uh, to our website um, at the end. So everybody can get access to these links and such. Um, Pat Mano asked, uh, and he's directing this at, at Johannes, but I, I would also encourage anybody else that has a, a viewpoint on this to, to weigh in. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit more about funding uh, from the EU to the member states for the purpose of implementation of the floods directive? Thank you, yes, I can. Um... There is, I, I'll start like this. There is no dedicated fund uh, which uh, member states can draw upon uh, to, to finance measures uh, for flood risk prevention, awareness, or, or, pre or uh, uh, protection. Uh, let, me, let me just uh, show some, a, a slide uh, very quickly. Sure which uh, will uh, add some graphics to the to the question or to the reply okay just a moment share screen it must be this one yes Okay, now uh, what you see here is the, the budget uh, for the next seven years for 2020, between 2021 and 2027, uh, almost, almost approved. And you see that for seven years, uh, there's going to be transfers uh, from the EU level to the member states. Uh, of a total of uh, one, uh, one trillion, uh, a bit more than one trillion euros. And in the, in the column next to it, which is uh, captioned uh, next generation EU, this is the, let's say the response to the, to the health crisis we are all facing, another 750 billion. So in total 1.8 uh, trillion for uh, for a for the following seven year period so 
that would be around 140 billion per year. This would be the, the GDP, let's say, of, uh, of a medium-sized uh, member state, if I, can, if I can describe it like this. Uh, and this should be compared to, the, to, the, to a GDP for the whole of the EU last year, 2019, of uh, 14 trillion. So whereas, whereas the, the amount of, uh, of uh, funds that flows from the EU level to the member state level uh, is, not, uh, is not tremendous, uh, uh, it, it is substantial, particularly for some of the member states. Not, so not for all, but for some, because the EU budget has that as its uh, one of its main uh, principles, uh, one of its main ideas behind it is to bring about a convergence between the member states. So member states who are, uh, let's say, further from the, from the average receive more funding than those that are above the average. Uh, so you see uh, on this slide that for co cohesion, resilience, and uh, let's say the European way of living, uh, culture, let's say, uh, 380 billion has been allocated and roughly the same amount, 356 billion for natural resources and environment, which also includes uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, now, uh, in terms of uh, disaster, or, or adaptation to climate change, uh, an estimate would be uh, around 8 billion euros. Uh, but uh, another thing that we need, we need, to, we need to note is that uh, the member states and the, and the, and the commission, uh, the member states and the commission, let's say, sign, metaphorically speaking, a partnership agreement and then on the basis of this partnership agreement, they elaborate uh, uh, operational programs, which uh, explain how, they, how EU funding is going to spend within the member states. In other words, uh, it is largely left to the member states to make decisions how uh, they, where they spend the funding, and uh, how much uh, funding comes from the, how, how they blend the funding. So with their own uh, national funds and the funds that are coming from the, from the EU. Uh, so as I said, no dedicated funding, rather co-funding. And this can cover everything, can cover physical infrastructure, can cover uh, uh, regional cooperation, can cover, um, capacity building so pretty wide okay thank you uh, a, a second question in that same uh, comment is uh, is how do states work together um, for shared objectives shared funding shared project implementation etc uh, for transboundary watersheds So first, first, uh, there we can we can say that there have been uh, bilateral or trilateral or multilateral agreements between the member states who are the riparian countries, let's say along a river. Uh, then, uh, then we have uh, we have uh, more for in, in terms of a more formalized cooperation or more organized, if you, if you like cooperation, we have the, the river basin commissions for the larger river basins. Those are uh, the, the two largest are the Rhine, uh, where the Netherlands is part of, and the Danube, where Austria is uh, part of. And, and those, uh, those river basins, those uh, commissions, they are elaborating uh, their, uh, let's call their own international flood risk management plans. Uh, within which they also have uh, measures uh, at, at the level of the river commission. Uh, beyond that, and at the whole, at the entire EU level, uh, I, I, I refer to this, but very briefly in, in my presentation, we have a common implementation st strategy which dates back to 2000, to 2000 actually, uh, within which we are organized in uh, in uh, in, a co in a in a main coordination group and in working groups, uh, and we have also a flood a flood working group 
through which we conduct our cooperation. So we have uh, twice a year uh, me meetings and we have also a, a digital platform where we upload all the information. It's public actually, you can find the uh, in detail, uh, all the discussions, all the presentations, all the workshop reports, everything is public for everyone to see. And this is this is our main conduit for cooperation. Great. Um, I'd like to also put in a plug. We have a, um, uh, a presentation uh, scheduled for our conference in May. Um, two people um, I think they're on the call today. Adrian Schmidt Britton and Mark Daniel Heinz are going to um, uh, present from the uh, International Commission for the Protection of the Rhine. Um, and so we're looking forward to that. It, we're going to have a track that's specifically oriented towards transboundary flood risk management. So um, hope people can join us in May. And we do have the chair of the Flood Protection Group of the Rhine Commission uh, amongst us, Jan Kreischel. Excellent. Just for information. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, so Kay Vanderbilt uh, asked um, about. I guess it, it looks like the the question here is is how do, how do we go about developing from a technical standpoint uh, aspects of valuing the risk. Um, uh, and other weighting schemes, as Mark described, um, in a normalized way among jointly affected nations. Um, is there a standard low, medium, or high risk threshold? Is that dealt with um, on a state-by-state -state basis? Um, and any references? Uh, I know that Kay is 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 beginning her. Um, study in in this area and so as a student she would like to uh, you know continue to read and, and do that sort of thing so I take that okay um, I, I partially answered the question I think in in the chat further down um, the directive does refer in terms of probability to high medium and low um, these aren't specified apart from the medium being, um, not greater, I think, than 100 years as a return period. Um, as part of the EU overview that was done for the flood mapping um, a, a few years ago, and again, this is published on the website that Ioannis just referred to, it does list out the, vari the, the, the range of flood event probabilities that different member states have adopted as their interpretations of high, medium and low. Um, so that's available and, and compiled in a document um, that, on the Commission's website. Um, the issue of risk is, is somewhat different. Um, uh, the directive does require member states to identify or define and identify areas of significant risk. But what represents significant risk in one member state can be very different from another. Um, so if you take Ireland, for example, where the level of risk overall would be only a fraction of the level of risk that the Netherlands faces, where clearly flooding is a potentially existential issue, the, 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 the definitions of what's significant in both countries may be very different. So how, so there isn't a common definition of high, medium or low risk um, that is left down to the competence of the, the individual member states. Um, and just looking at the, the follow on part of the question around joint investments, um, this isn't something I can speak to um, personally because um, the, the border area between Ireland and the UK um, is by chance actually very, has, has very little flood risk in, in the area. Um, so we don't have any joint um, cross border flood projects, um, although we have obviously cooperated in terms of flood risk assessments and so on. Um, I know this has happened in other member states. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether they have adopted joint assessments of risk, um, appraisals of, of damages and benefits and so on, or whether they're done twice, if you like, separately using each member state's um, legacy approach on that. I, I, I just don't know. I'm not sure if anybody else would like to add anything to that. Clements? Thank you. Um, 
I think there is different um, levels on, on how these issues are being treated. Um, I think from, from the Austrian perspective, uh, joint measures are being implemented mostly based on uh, projects being funded by the European Union, like Interact, uh, which uh, supports the implementation uh, of, of various uh, small, smaller uh, measures, and also life as a funding scheme is also very valuable. But uh, when we, for instance, in Austria, implement a measure in the border, region, we have to make sure that there is no negative consequences for the downstream country, or we have to coordinate with the downstream country how to compensate. So there is more or less on a administrative level, um, tools and instruments at hand uh, from the implementation of the measures, it's all being uh, set up via state treaties. So it's, it's funded by the states themselves. Like for instance, we do have a big um, project in the planning phase together with Switzerland so along the Rhine uh, in the Western part of Austria, which is the bordering river. And if this project comes, it will cost a little bit more than 1 billion euros. So this is a very big project which has, which has to be funded by the administration itself. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, can I, Jan, can I, Jan, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Jan Kruishoop from the Netherlands. I'm, I'm indeed. I'm president of the working group on the high and low water of the, the International Rhine Commission. Good to hear that um, Mark, Daniel, and Adrian are going to present uh, the Rhine Commission uh, in the EO meeting. Um, I've got an experience in, in the Netherlands because we are downstream and, uh, you know, it could be very effective for us to, to encourage the Germans or perhaps even the Austrians to do a lot of investments so uh, they, they keep the water in their country and it, it's not so very fast in our country. And we, we try to do that. We try to invest with Dutch money in, in Germany, but then th there is a border and a state border. That's very difficult. And uh, as Clement said, we are depending on uh, national uh, uh, tax raised money. And it's about 60 or 70 euro for each inhabitant each year. So it's not so much. It's, like, it's, it's even less than you're, you're, you're going to the fitness or, or whatever. But um, what I wanted to say is that between the European funding and the national funding, there's no funding, let's say, uh, for a river basin. And uh, we had a, uh, an audit by the European Court of Chambers and they, we had a discussion with them and we, we gave them the advice, perhaps it's possible to, to set up a kind of a river basin fund connected with your flood risk management plan. But uh, uh, perhaps it's, it's still a wish, but uh, that would be something in between, between the European funding which is for us sometimes very difficult to, to, to uh, attach to. And we're not, we're not reliant on it. We want to rely on our own system. And that's why we have in the Netherlands a totally uh, tax funded system. But that's, that's different in all the countries. Great, thank you. Um, another question here, and I guess I should preface this by uh, pointing out that, that the way that flood risk management in the U.S. is is done through the NFIP is the, the NFIP is the National Flood Insurance Program. So, insurance is a is 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 a very important part of of our flood risk management approach here in the U.S. and um, and it is a, a federal insurance program. Um, I know that insurance is is something that's looked at differently in different. Uh, areas. So I, I'd like to kind of put this question out for uh, broad uh, answers from, from the whole panel um, and, and talk a little bit about how insurance is used uh, to reduce risk. Uh, is, it, is it federal? Is it required? Is it, you know, so on and so forth? Well, perhaps uh, I can start. Uh... In the in the EU, so we don't we don't have uh, we don't have 
uh, flood risk insurance at the EU level. And uh, we have been uh, looking recently in our working group uh, on this matter, on uh, what's the story with uh, insurance, flood risk insurance coverage in, in the EU uh, across the various, uh, across the 27 member states. And we also had a, a workshop on that. The report is not public, but it will be in, in a few months' time. And I think that what we can, uh, it's also very relevant to adaptation. And uh, it's one aspect of the new adaptation strategy, insurance uh, from uh, natural disasters. Um, one thing we can say is that, uh, that for sure, each member state has its own uh, arrangement. And you can find everything from uh, not, not covered at all to a system which is uh, not quite, but almost uh, a national one and covers the whole territory of, uh, of a country. Uh, but, uh, but we are in, a, in an information collection uh, mode still. And uh, the forthcoming report, uh, we, we all expect it with, uh, with anticipation. So there is no one approach as you have in the in the United States. We have a fund at the EU level which uh, contributes to uh, ameliorating the damage after natural disasters. It can also give in an advance before the before the works start. Uh, but it's not an insurance in the classical sense. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be some level of uh, distraction and above for member states or regions within member states to qualify for support from this fund. Um, so, go ahead. Uh, right input from Ireland's perspective. Um, I've kind of answered the question in the chat a little bit. Um, we wouldn't have states, a state insurance uh, program, a state funded insurance program. Um, the state would provide um, humanitarian aid um, for those who suffer uh, flooding and uh, need to evacuate from their homes. Um, but that isn't intended to be insurance. It isn't intended to cover the entire cost of the damages. Um, it's really a social payment. Um, insurance, flood insurance in Ireland operates through an open market um, through commercial providers, um, normally bundled in with um, the standard home insurance packages. Um, we have seen over recent years that it is becoming increasingly more difficult to get um, for those who are um, identified as being in flood prone areas or have experienced flooding on a number of occasions. Um, and that is a growing issue, uh, which in itself is a, an incentive, if you like, to ensure, try and ensure that planning and future development occurs outside of floodplain areas. And we have um, statutory guidelines around, around spatial planning and flood risk management. Adding on the on the Austrian case, uh, I think it's quite similar. Like like Mark describes, it's it's covered by the property insurance and it's kept at a very low level. So if it hits you, <clears throat> you you will get back a very low refund. However, in the end, uh, the state is stepping in, and if it's a catastrophe, it will uh, cover most of, of the direct damages uh, you, you suffer. For companies in Austria, if they are in flood prone areas, it's obligatory. So they have to insure against flooding, but uh, it's, yeah, it's on the private market, like in Ireland. Sounds good. Um, well, I think that's the questions that we have. We're, we've got about nine minutes if anybody uh, has anything that they want to, to add to it. Uh, I would like to uh, thank our panelists for um, some really interesting presentations and for a, a great discussion and for um, staying up uh, a little later than your normal workday, I guess. So uh, we appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I was thinking that I have a couple of slides to share, so maybe it's a good time now. Uh, yep, absolutely. We... So, so I just, um, before we go, I just want to remind that um, 
our next event is going to be in the spring. Um, we will have a, a webinar about produce management and mapping in Austria. And right now I'm going to share with all of you our newsletter, the first newsletter we have from the International Committee, so you can have more information about how it works and who we are and how you can participate if you're interested. And for those of you who are members of the ASFPM, um, don't forget to click on International Liaison if you want to be in the mailing list for the ASFPM International Committee. And if you have any questions or you want to get more information about future events, you are also welcome to email us. I'm going to right now stop the, the screen sharing and see what I did here. Um, can you stop it for me? Because I, I'm not seeing right now. Uh, here it is. <laughs> I, I just hide it. Okay. And, I, so, um, and I can I can I have a question? Sure. Can I also become member? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, so I'm just putting right now the yeah. So anyone can be a member of ASFPM. Um, there's a fee though. It's an annual fee, and here it is. So this is the now you can find. In the in the chat, I just added uh, this newsletter and this information on how you can um, join us. But yeah, any um, question you have, um, we'll, we'll be happy to reply, um, David and I. And as well, um, before anybody else adds a question to the chat, I want to thank you so much for your time. I know everybody has been extremely busy. Uh, the COVID has put more on our place than we ever expected. And it's been kind of challenging to organize this webinar, but I'm really, really happy that we could finally come together and, and make it happen. I think it's um, very necessary for us here in the US to be more in contact with the EU, knowing more about what is happening, happening innovations and uh, trying to find um, ideas that can help us to improve our risk management and the other way around. We are very happy to continue with the uh, exchange of knowledge next year and find a topic that can be relevant for the US, uh, for the EU in that case and, and keep going the conversation. So let's see if there's any final remarks, comments, questions. Um, just one one thing is, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that came to this webinar who who may not be members. Uh, reach out to us. Um, you know, we want to keep people included, um, and and that in includes people uh, that may or may not be members of ASFPM. We 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 don't discriminate. So um, so please reach out to us and let us know if you're interested in participating. Um, and the the easiest way to stay in touch with the things that we're um, that we plan and what we do will be through the ASFPM, you know, portals and uh, membership. But uh, don't let that be a barrier to to staying in touch. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Also from my side, I think I can speak also for for Clemens, Kimo, and uh, Mark. Thank you very much for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anna, I will provide my slides to you in PDF in tomorrow. Perfect. Okay. Great. Yeah, and that's another thing I wanted to mention. So um, our website, if you go to ASFPM International Committee, it's not ready yet. So we just got a new website to look for the whole ASFPM. And most of the material that is there is from um, uh, alt material, basically. <laughs> um, David and I are pretty new at the International Committee, so we have been on board for a year and a half now, and so we are trying to update um, material and everything, so hopefully next month we can have something more decent, And but we are planning to put all the presentations available for anyone who wants to check, um, and then all the webinars that we are going to be doing. So, 
Yeah, you know, if you want to add something, David. Uh, just, uh, you know, uh, in the chat, uh, while the chat box is up, there's a link to our website. So please just uh, look at it and, and let us know if there's anything we can do to provide further information on this topic. Mm -hmm. and, and finally, I just want to thank the Institute of Europe in the Studies at Berkeley for hosting the webinar. And Marlon, thank, thank you for the invitation to participate. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care, guys. Have Thanks. a good day. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye, -bye. Anna, please feel free to forward some questions if they are still coming in. Okay. You, you have, and on the presentation, there is my email address as well, so people can see it there. Perfect. Perfect. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you bye. very much.